Chapter Thirty Three. I decided I needed to throw myself into work, and so for the next hour, I did just that. I made calls, organized meetings, faxed those swatch details to Kelsey, and paid bills. I was doing anything and everything. I had to, and I was doing great until I heard that gaudy helicopter. Ah, <sighs> I sunk back into my chair. How long was he going for this time? Suddenly, my zipped leather organizer buzzed. That gold iPhone was lit up. <sighs> Message from Marcos. Wipe off that lipstick, <laughs> honey. It's gloss. I grabbed the tissue and immediately wiped it off. Hearing him talking to April upstairs, eventually those custom Italian shoes of his came clanking down the stairway. And walked across the wooden floor of the living room. His footsteps drew closer and closer until I surprisingly caught his shadow abruptly stop in the office doorway, as if he was hesitating. I leaped up from the office chair and threw the tissue into the trash. Marcos then quickly walked in, glaring at me. Those eyes said it all. Looking more beautiful than ever, he stood there in a navy suit with an ivory cotton shirt tucked into it. His damp hair effortlessly slicked back. <sighs> he was growing more and more gorgeous by the day. Without a word, he grabbed me from behind the desk and took me into the printer room. Only slightly closing the door behind us. He quickly grabbed my face in between his strong hands and pinned me up against the wall, kissing me desperately, thrusting his tongue deep into my mouth. Just when I thought I had it all together this morning, I swiftly became lost within that decadent spell of his again, even if it was only for but a moment. Three days. He whispered into my lips, kissing them lightly, finally pulling away from me. Without waiting for my response, he opened the door and left me in the printer room. <sighs> Meltdown. Breathing heavily, I slumped onto the wall beside the printers and glanced up at the ceiling. Thank Christ, there are no cameras in here. I went out into the kitchen, pretending that I needed a glass of water. But instead, I watched Lucas, Philippe, and two other men, all looking smooth in their dark suits, meet Marcos at the front entrance, duly escorting him to the helicopter. And no matter how many times I saw that helicopter slowly rise off the ground, my heart sunk into the pit of my stomach. I was madly in love with Marcos Almeida. <sighs> I need some fresh air. I glanced down at my cell phone. Ten thirty-eight a.m. Good time to go to Brianna's. I jumped in my G-class and slowly rolled down the mountain, cruising to Carpinteria, and trying, just for one second, to erase Marcos Almeida from my mind. Chapter Thirty Four. Pulling up at Brianna's beautiful Tuscan-style villa, stretched along the beach, was exactly what I needed. The sounds of the lapping waves, the smell of the fresh sea breeze—ah, it was perfect. I knocked on her front door and quickly heard that massive dog of hers pounding toward me, barking like mad. One second. I heard Brianna call from behind the beautifully crafted glass. Finally, managing to wrestle past her dog, she opened the door. "Hey!" she cried, struggling to restrain the big beast. "Oh, come in!" I quickly stumbled inside and gave the dog a pat, watching it wag its long, ropey tail. It liked me. <laughs> Thank God. "Oh, I just got back in from a walk." She said, breezing into the kitchen. "Oh, how was it?" I asked, 
quickly following behind her and admiring the rustic charm of the home with its high ceilings fitted with thick wooden beams set against some gloriously expansive views of the glimmering ocean. Oh, it was lovely, she said, standing against the kitchen island, her face getting lost within the ceramic planter of Philonopsis orchids. No fog this morning, which is nice for a change. How's your morning going? Where should I start? Oh, it's fine, I grinned, watching her grab two big mugs, turning on the kettle. You know, just getting some office work done for April and sending Marcus off. Oh? And where is he off to? She asked, pulling a large foil bag from a cardboard box on the floor. Ah, uh, I'm not sure, I answered, but he'll be back in a few days. Brianna gave me an exhausted glance. God, he's always traveling. It's a wonder you see him. <sighs> I see him all right. <laughs> like shadows in the night, I chuckled. Pun intended. Oh, you know, I don't know how April stands it, she muttered, taking some scissors and cutting across the bag. Like, I couldn't do it with Dean, she shook her head. Oh, trust me, lady, I can't do it either. Well, I guess she's used to it, I suggested, giving a slight shrug. Bitch has a heart of steel. Did he look nice on the cover of the Forbes magazine with Arthur Lim? One morning, about a month ago, I walked into the atrium to find April reading a Forbes magazine with Marcos on the cover. Power Players of the North, it read. Marcos hates publicity, so I have no idea why he did it. Yeah, I smiled. He looks so gorgeous. <laughs> did I just say that out loud? I was glad Brianna was distracted with smelling the tea. Oh, she moaned, thrusting the bag up to my nose. Here, smell this. I took a deep breath and was hit with the most intense aromas of jasmine. Oh, wow, I gasped, glimpsing at the millions of little rolled pearls of tea. That smells so delicious. I know, right? Brianna gushed. I have like six cups a day. <laughs> Almost as obsessed as me, I snickered. Brianna poured our steaming tea and we moved into the living room, taking a seat on her comfy ivory sofa. So uh, you must have heard I'm having a party here on Saturday night for Dean's birthday. Yes, Marcus and April will be coming, I nodded. Yeah, thanks for the RSVP, she said sipping her hot brew. I got it last week. But I was wondering if you'd like to come also. I awkwardly chuckled. Oh, <laughs> I don't know if April and Marcus would like that. I gritted my teeth together. I mean, I know for a fact Marcus won't mind, but I'm not too sure about April. You know, she's tricky. You know how these women are when it comes to the help. Well, I am inviting you, Brianna insisted firmly, as my friend and my guest. <laughs> this woman is amazing. I would love to come. I smiled at her sweet face. Thank you. <laughs> oh, great. I can't wait, she said excitedly, clapping her hands together. Make sure you glam it up, sweetie. Do you need me to do anything? I offered. Oh, no, no. Brianna quickly dismissed. I've got catering. I nodded. Okay then. Chapter 35 Brianna and I sat for the next two hours, enjoying each other's company, realizing we had more than many things in common. We shared general chit-chat about life in Santa Barbara, the people in it, and our lives prior. Brianna was different from most of these high-flying women of Santa Barbara. Her years were spent on the sands of Zuma Beach, attending Malibu High. Yes, she was a real Californian girl, blonde and beautiful, yet seriously down to earth, with hints of bohemian flair. At 20, she met Dean at a beach party one night, been together ever since. Okay, so around 7 Saturday night, she confirmed, 
wrapping her tan arms around me at the front door. I'll be here, I smiled, handing me a big bag of jasmine tea. I parted ways with her and rolled down the sandy street in my car. It was past 2 p.m. by the time I left, so grabbing a fresh juice at Coast Village, I went to collect Henry from school and hopefully avoiding April, whom I knew was looming around Montecito, attending some luncheon on East Valley Road. Driving along the 101 North, it naturally didn't take long for Marcos to seep into my mind once again. (sighs) Sighing, I glanced down at that gold iPhone on the passenger seat as it silently glanced back at me. Later that evening, I ate a quiet dinner with April and Henry, and for a change, I actually didn't mind April's company. Admittedly, though, the only good thing about Marcus being away was that my body got a much-needed break. I was so used to riding on that 24-hour hormonal roller coaster when he was home that it was nice to finally get off of it. (laughs) And let's face it, after last night's sex, my body needed a few days to recuperate. But after the first day of Marcus being gone, I was over it. I hated him not being home. Those three days without him dragged on like I was moving through molasses. I tried to keep myself occupied, but that did nothing to help. It was crap. What made it even worse was that my gold iPhone remained dead silent. (sighs) The hex of Marcos Almeida. I was bound to him, and it was driving me crazy. If I had any idea of how much my life would change in the last three months... I wouldn't have believed it. And my parents, if they cottoned on to any of this, they would probably disown me. They're the conservative type with those traditional ideals. You get married, shut up, and get on with it. That kind of thing. But I couldn't live like that. I lived with my heart as my compass, guiding me through my life. How can it be wrong if it feels so damn right? Marcus felt right. I knew I was in love with him. And I know it's rich to say, but I was pretty sure he was feeling the same about me. And if he wasn't, then he wasn't far from it. Chapter 36 I woke up Thursday morning doing cartwheels in my bed. (laughs) Not really, but I felt like it. Marcus is home today. I bounced out of the blankets and got ready for the day ahead. And ironically, the day breezed by with everything running smoothly. April had been out all afternoon at a Sotheby's art auction held at the Biltmore and arrived home at 4.30 p.m. Folding my freshly washed laundry and putting it away in my drawers, I suddenly heard a helicopter close by. My heart leaped out of my chest. It was the only time I was actually happy to hear it. Marcos. Rushing to the floor-length windows in the bathroom, I watched the dark helicopter slowly descend toward the property. I could see him sitting in his usual spot, and funnily, he was glancing down at my quarters, seemingly searching for me. I snickered to myself, sneakily peering through the Venetian blinds. I wanted to watch him without anyone catching me staring at him like a lunatic, and that included him as well. The chopper was full of men, and as the doors opened, Marcus, Lucas, and Philippe, along with a couple of others, piled out, running under the slowing blades. I felt like a little kid at a candy shop, I was exploding with excitement inside. At 6 p.m., fresh after a nice warm shower, I walked up to the house and glimpsed April pottering around the kitchen table. Oh, hey, Barn, how are you, honey? She called, seeing me come in through the side door. Oh, I'm fine, thank you, April. I smiled. How was the auction? Oh, 
It was spectacular, she gushed, clutching her hands against her chest. Very successful. I bought a piece. It won't be ready until next week. You can see it then. <laughs> Can't help yourself, can you, woman? It sounds great, I replied. Where's Henry? Oh, he's upstairs talking to his papi. They'll be down in just a minute. I finally heard the two of them coming down the stairway together. I tried to keep myself busy, but I could feel that gnawing anxiety slowly rise within me once again. I'll think about it, son. I heard that delicious, deep voice murmur, almost in the kitchen. Then I saw him. Our eyes locked for a brief second. <gasps> Total body meltdown. Hey, bunny. He smiled casually, walking by me and going into the fridge. How's things? Fine, thank you, I answered, feeling my cheeks burn painfully. I wanted to jump him. How was your trip? He shut the fridge and poured himself some cloudy apple juice. Ah, <sighs> tiring, he said, glancing at me. No eyes tonight. Do you want some of this? <gasps> What the fuck? What had happened? Where were those eyes that I loved so much? Weirdly, Marcus was acting very normal, which to me was totally abnormal. I'll have one, honey. April chimed in from behind us, thumbing through her emails on her iPhone. I smiled softly. I'll have one too, please. He handed me a glass, avoiding my eyes, and sat down exhaustively at the table in his usual seat, followed by April and Henry. Feeling a little confused, I took my glass to the table and sat down. Was he over me already? Dave walked over, presenting our dinner to us, looking five-star as always. Thanks, Dave. Looks incredible. Marcus nodded, glancing up at him. Ha! <laughs> You're welcome. I'll see you all in the morning, he replied, getting his bag. Oh, and no dinner tomorrow night. Is that right? Thank you, Dave. We'll be out tomorrow night, April confirmed, pushing her phone to the end of the table and snuggling up against Marcos. I was screaming inside. Bitch, get your hands off of him. I could barely look at the two of them. Marcos sat there, not pushing her away, but not looking entirely comfortable either. She immediately sensed his awkwardness. Oh, honey, I've missed you, she protested. He glanced at her as if to say, not in front of everyone. April nodded and pursed her lips together quickly. Maybe he was just really tired, and I was overanalyzing. So, dinner with Terry at Lucky's tomorrow? I asked, trying to make small talk, carefully watching Marcos take some garlic scallops from the platter. <sighs> Still, no eyes. Oh, yes. April answered, helping herself to the morso. Uh, should be a great night. Bitch, we know your idea of a great night after last weekend. What are you up to tomorrow night, Bunny? Marcos asked me politely. Oh, come on, honey. What's with all this cordialness? Give me those eyes already. Uh, well, I'll probably have a quiet night in, I glanced at him. Although I may go downtown to watch a movie. I'll see what's on. Um, and actually, I've been invited to Brianna Bersergio's party on Saturday night. April almost choked on her scallop. She glared at me for several moments and then glared at Marcos. <laughs> Brianna Bersergio, she cried incredulously, returning her attention to me. You've been invited to her party? Her happy face fell from the table like London Bridge, and the air swiftly became icy. Oh shit, you've done it now, Bonnie. Yes, she has, I replied, glancing at her face, now harder than stone. 
She snickered in disgust, shaking her head at Marcos disdainfully. I had never seen this side of April, and it was nasty as hell. <laughs> what a fucking bitch. Bonnie, I'd hate to point it out to you so obviously, she sneered coldly. <laughs> but you are, in fact, the help. It's not appropriate for you to go to parties like these, nor to be friends with our friends. You are my assistant. Do not forget that. I was mortified. I sat there dying at that dinner table, feeling about as big as a mouse. No, wait, as big as a flea. I had never, ever felt so humiliated in my entire life. I am sure this cunt of a woman, from a middle-class family herself, I might add, had balls tucked away within those trousers she wore to be able to lash out at me so viciously. <laughs> what the fuck? I swallowed hard and could not believe her words that slapped my face over and over. <sighs> I hated her. Hated her. Unable to speak or look at anyone at the table, I stared down at my empty plate in shock. I could feel everyone's eyes glued on me. Bonnie, come on, hold your head high for fuck's sake. <sighs> Taking a deep breath of courage, I finally glanced up. And for the first time ever, I saw heavy pain etched within Marcus's dark eyes, glaring at me sympathetically. He was hurting for me. His jaw was clenched, and I knew he was about to tip over the edge as April's spiteful words continued to marinate the air. I was desperate to get out of there. Excuse me, I whispered, standing up and leaving the table. You need to apologize immediately, I heard Marcus mutter flatly to April as I walked away. Honey, I'm just saying what everyone's thinking, April detested, raising her voice. She's the help. She needs to remember her place in the world. That's it. She's a fucking human being, Marcos snapped over my shoulder. I jumped with fright. How dare you ever speak to anyone like that in this house? Holy God. His anger scared the shit out of me. I had never, ever heard Marcos like this. I had never even seen him get angry before. I glanced over my shoulder and immediately saw April holding her head in her hands, beginning to sob quietly. Poor Henry, meanwhile, looking like he just ate a stick of dynamite, quickly ran away from the table. <gasps> Standing to his feet in disgust, Marcos clearly wasn't done. Did you forget my place in the world? He shouted, his voice riddled with pain, punching his chest with his arm, glaring at her. Huh? Did you? I was poorer than the fucking dog on the street. My father on his dying breath, still trying to feed his family. My three-year-old sister, dying in his arms from starvation. My brother bleeding to death in front of my eyes, shot in the heart because he stole some fucking water. Marcos was incessant with rage, watched him in horror, tears welling up within my shocked eyes. How do you think my mother could protect us, huh? He screamed, vehemently throwing his arms in the air. We had nothing, no water, no fucking food, no fucking money, ever, and you... You sit here in this bullshit life like you're above everybody else. <laughs> Stop. April begged through her inconsolable sobbing, holding her pleading hands in front of her face. Please stop. But Marcos didn't. Seeing his jaw tremble with rage, I was sure he was going to cry. He stood there, his chest panting heavily, glaring down at April with absolute 
repulsion. You embarrass me as my wife, he muttered, barely getting the words out of his mouth, crumbling with emotion. April, utterly beside herself with grief, dropped her face onto the table within the refuge of her shaking hands and began to wail. Yes, wail. Swallowing the last of his apple juice, Marcus slammed the glass down on the dinner table and stormed off, disappearing into the darkness of the house. I quickly slipped through the side door and quietly walked through the gardens in a daze. I entered my dark quarters, wanting to shut the world out forever. <sighs> Tears of despair streamed down my face as I implored the solace of the scarlet roses outside my bedroom windows, watching them as they reached up into the starry cosmos. <sighs> I burst out crying, falling onto my bed, crying with torment, crying with humiliation, crying for Marcos. I had no idea that that was the kind of life he had come from. It destroyed me. I lit some candles and lay there in that darkness, lust in my own torturous oblivion. Moments later, the door suddenly creaked open into my quarters. Peering through the candlelight and rushing to wipe my tears, my swollen eyes glimpsed Marcos, looking very distressed. He stood there, wrought with so much internal affliction that I burst into tears again. He instantly collapsed to his knees. <sighs> I'm so sorry, he cried through a pleading whisper, holding out his arms. <laughs> Please forgive me. I stumbled off the bed and fell to my knees, tumbling into his desperate arms. He embraced me tightly, squeezing my body through his agony, and we cried together. I never, ever wanted to let this man go. Shh, I whispered, pressing his head against mine. It's okay, baby. I cradled his head within my hands, kissing his distraught face, watched the tears flow from those deeply troubled, haunting, dark eyes. This will never happen again, I promise you, he murmured, caressing the nape of my neck with his strong hands. You are my light. Through my wet tears, he kissed me deeply and pulled me against his chest once more. We rocked back and forth, enveloped within the candle flames flickering around my quarters for what felt like an eternity. And eventually, Marcos picked me up from the floor and stripped the clothing from my body and then gently put me in between the blankets, nursing me within his warm, comforting arms. And that was our night, lying there amongst the silence of our breathing, naked, succumbing to the glint of the moon hanging over the dark ocean and holding on to each other until we both fell asleep.